Welcome to Tech 2020, the fourth in MGIP's attempt to bridge digital pedagogies and social emotional learning. I am Anantha Duryapa, the director of the UNESCO Mahatma Gandhi Institute. I don't think we would have ever dreamed of when we all met in the beautiful city of Vishakhapatnam in 2019 that we will be will been locked up for nearly now seven months actually in most countries. The world has changed significantly. And I believe the COVID-19, the crisis, the pandemic, has brought forward to one overriding acknowledgement that we humans are really struggling to live within ourselves, trying to find peace, trying to come to terms with such a drastic impact on our lives. Now, this trend has been already on the rise before COVID, but I think COVID has really pushed it and really increased it exponentially. Now, I was flabbergasted when I read a WHO report in 2015, mind-boggling actually, when it reports that 25% of children in India between the ages of 13 and 15 have some form of mental health problem. Anxiety, stress, depressions. And in that same report, it says that 800,000 suicides are reported each year across the globe among young people. When we talk about sustainable development and sustainability, this is one trend which is definitely not sustainable. We have to address this. And then the second one is we are struggling to live with others. If you, if you notice racism, the whole issue of systemic racism has emerged in the US, but it's across the globe. If we really uh, sit down and reflect, we see it across the globe. The intolerance of others is on the rise. We're not able to understand and appreciate another person's views and perspective. It's only us or mine. It was interesting in a youth survey in India in 2016, over 6,000 young people from 19 states. Uh, and again, some of very interesting but disturbing trends. Now, 45% of these young people do not believe that interracial marriages should be allowed. They are opposed to it. 53% feel that people have become less tolerant of others. These are disturbing trends, and these are our future generations. Globally, MGIP in 2016, 2015, we collected over 1,200 voices. We call it Youth Speak from over 120 countries. So we are talking about the globe here. And these dominant views were emerging among these young people. They feel that in times of national security, it is okay to use force against others. I would sort of say this is violence in many ways. It's okay for some people to have more opportunities than others. And here we talk about equality, education for all. And what's more disturbing is they have a perspective that there should be fixed gender roles for men and women in order to have a stable society. This is taking us many steps backward, not just one, many steps backward. And then the third is living in peace with nature. Now we see nature as a resource base, but nature is a living entity. And in a 2009 seminar report from the Stockholm Resilience Center called the Planetary Boundaries. There were identified nine. We had already crossed two very important ones. One is climate change. Everybody knows about what those implications are. Majority of us anyway. And two, we still have some skeptics. Uh, but we'll change that very soon. What is more frightening is the biodiversity loss. In a recent IPBES, that's the Intergovernmental Panel, very similar to the climate change, but on biodiversity, estimates that we will be losing a million species over the next decade 
due to human activities. A million species, and it's again mind-boggling. Think about it, we as homo species, uh, homo sapiens, are just one species. And here we are wiping out a million species of plant and animals. Can you imagine the numbers? Let's imagine if we wipe out the human sp uh, species, that's seven billion, right? So it's unsustainable. These are really, and we need to learn how to live with nature, not to think about nature just as for exploitation for our well-being. It's about living with nature because living with nature in harmony will bring human flourishing for us. So I'm going to put forward four propositions today and maybe one take-home message. My first proposition is that the education system that we have now, today, perpetuates the existential crisis that we are finding ourselves. Why do I say that? First, we look at education purely as from an instrumental perspective and not constitutive. What do I mean by that? Instrumental, in a sense, is purely just to satisfy or as a means for an end. And unfortunately, that end, the way that society has evolved, that end is just purely income and material wealth. That's our social status. That's what everybody is looking for. If I'm going to, going to school, if I'm going to the university, it's not about the pursuit of knowledge. It's about getting the highest income. And why? Because that's how you're judged in society. Somebody who's picking garbage is as important as somebody who is a cardiologist. Because without the person to pick your garbage, can you imagine what will happen? Many countries in Europe have witnessed that, where garbage just piled up when there was a strike. We just can't. We, we need to respect every particular person in our society for what they are. And, and at the macro level, what do we measure? We measure, we manage what we ma measure. And what do we measure? We, manage, we measure human capital. How do we cal calculate human capital as economists? I'll tell you that. Literacy, enrollments, and multiply it by the wages. Nothing about human flourishing. And so all our investment in education is focused on that. So it perpetuates that system. And so it propagates the you against I, or the I versus you, us versus them at a macro scale, and it just keeps on getting into a vicious cycle. A simple metaphor is one ladder, and everybody is trying to reach to the top. And so we are stomping on everybody else, we are pushing down everybody, because that's where we are moving towards. I still remember from my school days, when we finished the exams, and when the exam results are out, I really hated those pesky exams when they have once in a year. You just memorize and you, you try to learn to pass the exams. Nothing about learning itself. And when one comes back and I say, oh, I've got 85%, I'm really happy because the previous exam I had 70 that's 15 points much better. The first thing my parents ask me is, so who was the top? And if you say 95, well, why not? Why aren't you at the 95? It's a never ending game here. And this whole thing about merit to merits, a merit system. Daniel Malkovitz talks it really eloquently in the meritocracy trap. It's another system to create a non-egalitarian society. This is not the way to move forward. And our education systems have been designed in that such a way. We need to deconstruct that. Proposition two is we need an education for human flourishing. Flourishing in a way that you have the freedom to be able to achieve the life you have reason to value. Working within the conformity of society, 
working together with society, working together with nature, which means you handle the three struggles, living within yourself, living with the others, and living with nature. It trains us, an education that system that trains us to inquire, to be curious, and be critical for our own understanding, rather than just going into school and just taking what the teacher says. It's about a dialogue. It's about, it's about an exploration trains us to be within what we call the resilience zone, something that folks at Hamry University had come up with that we work very closely with and is drawn from the secular ethics work of the Dalai Lama. And how we have to be in the resilience zone. When we go up, when we get angry, we, are, we become potential to fight. How do you get back into that? And if you're in the lows, where you're in depressed, sad, how to get back? It's okay to be angry. It's okay to be sad. We need to train ourselves to get back into where we are calm. Train us to be empathetic. Train us empathetic in a way to sort of say, I understand the other. Not from my perspective, but from their perspective. And then, of course, to be compassionate and to be kind. That's extremely important. You have to do something. And the last variable that I, quality that we should have in our education systems is that it must be fun. We should have fun when we learn. Proposition three, and this is important. It needs a science and evidence-based approach to design such education systems because it's complex. And much of the research from the sciences of learning has not really trickled itself down into the classroom into teacher training programs, right? Research has shown that when you have standardized one-time examinations or assessments, just don't contribute to learning. What's more efficient is about having it continuous, continuous recall. That propagates learning, but it's never been brought down to the teaching to the classroom, to our education system. So at the Institute, my team and I, we have worked over this for quite some time, looking at many of the frameworks, and we came up with a little play on Einstein's equation, and we call it EMC squared. E stands for empathy, M for mindfulness. Mindfulness means emotion regulation, attention regulation. C for compassion, and the last C is for critical inquiry. You need that critical inquiry. You need that cognitive dimension as well as the emotional dimensions. It's about a whole brain approach that understands the interplay between the emotionals and the cognition or the intellectual. And once we get that well done, I think we're on our trajectory for education for human flourishing. As Daniel Kahneman was very eloquently put in system one, system two thinking, the whole thing with the EMC squared is to modify that system one thinking of the three apps, fight, freeze, and flight, into what I would call mindful empathy compassion. So the first reaction when you get, if somebody tells you a nasty thing, is not to be angry or to fight back, is to be kind and empathetic and to sort of say, there must be a reason why he is so angry today. His day might not have been great. Let me see how I can get him back into the resilience zone. See, that never comes to our immediate system one thinking. And of course, system two kicks in and we hope that with this change in system one and system two, we really have an education for human flourishing. And it needs to be built into every uh, discipline that we have. Math, science, geography, history. Let's not do the emotional as a subject itself, which is what has been a push for having social emotional learning as a subject by itself. No, it has to mediate across the whole education system. And with that framework, how do we do the pedagogy? And we talk about a system that we have developed here at the Institute called Libre, freedom, games to make it fun, 
immersive, experiential, interactive, collaboration, storytelling, narrative, discussion, dialogues, recall. This is all the part of how we consider a new education for human flourishing. The last proposition that I want to make, and this is very important because this is why it has to go beyond rhetoric by saying we need all these things. How do we assess the learning? Right? It has to be continuous. It has to be dynamic. It has to be interactive. Many of the features that I've already talked about. Individualize. Right? Not having the standardized one size fits all and having it at one point in time. It's to be always continuous and dynamic. There's always interaction. And failure is embraced as a learning process. Right now, failure is punished. Failure is taboo. But I think one of the best learning uh, tools is failure. And let's embrace it. And let's not say you have not learned because just by failing itself is a learning process. And let me finish off today by one take-home message which comes out from the four propositions is be your own benchmark which will allow you to be comfortable with yourself, comfortable with the other and comfortable with nature. Thank you very much. <laughs>